Hello, everyone. My name is Allison Dennis. I serve as executive director for the Sitka Center for Art and Ecology. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to Sitka's spring keynote, Naturalists of the Long Now with Ian Ben Collar. Ian, we are thrilled to have you here. Here is Cascade Head on the North Central Oregon coast. We acknowledge and thank the first peoples and stewards of this place, who today are actively represented by the Confederated Tribes of the Grand Ron and the Confederated Tribes of the Siletz Indians. If you are joining in from somewhere that is not here and you would like to share a land acknowledgement in the chat, we invite you to do so. We want to thank the Harold and Arlene Schnitzer Care Foundation and Jordan Schnitzer for their extraordinary stewardship and sponsorship of Sitka. Thank you to all of our generous uh, sponsors and foundations, including Schwabi Williamson and Wyatt, McMinimins, Scut Ceramics, Framing Resource, Brian Potter Design, Park Lane Suites, Lake Oswego Festival of the Arts, Palettes Northwest, Explore Lincoln City, Siltstone Wines, McLean's Printmaking Supplies, the James F. and Marion L. Miller Foundation, the Robert and Mercedes Eicholtz Foundation, the Kinsman Foundation, Oregon Community Foundation, Oregon Arts Commission, and Oregon Cultural Trust. As Sitka celebrates its 52nd birthday this month, we want to thank Sitka's co-founders, Jane and Frank Boyden, Sitka's past and present board and staff members, along with countless volunteers, neighbors, members, and financial supporters. Thank you. And tonight we want to give special thanks to current Sitka board member and JDC Fine Art Gallery Director Jennifer DiCarlo for making Ian's talk and Sitka stay possible. In addition to this talk, JDC Fine Art, which is located in Glen Eden Beach in the Salishan Marketplace on the Oregon coast, invites you to an opening reception on Saturday, May 21st, that's this upcoming Saturday, from 5 to 7 p.m., for an exhibit of recent photographic work by Ian Van Collar. I can't wait to see the show and uh, Ian will be there. So if you are on the coast this Saturday, we hope you will join us. That's five to seven on Saturday. And Jennifer's here in the background. You, you wanna yes. say hi, Jennifer. Please do come. It would be so nice. You'll have a chance to meet Ian and more importantly, maybe see this beautiful work <laughs> <laughs> for yourself in real life. So with that, we'll just turn it over. That's great. Ian's show will uh, run at JDC Fine Art Gallery from the 21st through June 20, uh, 25th. So if you're coming to Sitka for a workshop in June, you can also come and check out Ian's show and Jennifer's gallery. Also a shout out to Rowboat Gallery. They're located in that same marketplace. They represent lots of beloved Sitka artists. So there's lots to see when you plan your trip. Also this weekend at Sitka's Coastal Campus, we are hosting a print show and sale of rarely shown work from our Jordan Schnitzer Printmaking Residency Program. So please come and visit us at Sitka and see the prints. There are some real treasures to be found. 100% of the sale proceeds from the print show support Sitka's nonprofit programs. The print show runs this Thursday through Sunday. That's the 19th through the 22nd of May and will be open all four days from 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. Special thanks to my colleagues, Katie McClintock and Lisa DeGrace for co-curating the show and sale. Sitka's 2022 summer workshop season is online now with workshops from the end of May into October. So please join our workshop and help support our wonderful professional instructors after a two year teaching dry spell. And uh, one more announcement, if you have not heard, Sitka's art, uh, annual art invitational has three exciting changes to announce. So this fall's show will take place a few weeks earlier from October 14 through 16, instead of uh, November. There will be three full days, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, instead of two to see the show. And we will bring the show to a new venue, this year's art invitational will take place at Oregon Contemporary Gallery in Portland's vibrant North Portland Kenton neighborhood with lots of other shops and restaurants and creative spaces that you can plan your visit around. So stay tuned for more uh, announcements about that. This is a sneak preview for the fall. And uh, you can find more information about all of our spring, summer and fall events and workshops at sitkacenter.org. I bet uh, some of my colleagues may post some links for more information about some of those things in the chat tonight too, so keep your eyes open. If you're not on Sitka's mailing list and you would like to be, you can also share your address 
in the chat and we'll add you. Okay, so tonight, if you have questions for our speaker, please share them through the Q&A or chat features on your Zoom menu. When we shift to questions, I'll uh, read your questions aloud for Ian so you can sit back and relax and enjoy the conversation. And now it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's keynote speaker. Ian Van Coller was born and raised in South Africa. He moved to the United States in 1992 where he received a BFA from Arizona State University and MFA from the University of New Mexico. Van Coller has been a professor of photography at Montana State University in Bozeman since 2006, where he lives with his wife, two children, and two dogs. His work has been widely exhibited in the United States and internationally, and is included in over 50 public collections, including the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the Getty Research Institute. Van Coller is a 2018 John Simon Guggenheim Fellow, as well as a Fellow of the Explorers Club. Locally, his work is represented by JDC Fine Art and hyper locally, he is an artist in residence at Sitka now. I know technically your mics are all muted, but we are practitioners of magical realism here at Sitka. So wherever you are, please make some noise that will travel and welcome Ian Van Coller to the Sitka Center. Thank you, Allison. Um, and thanks so much for, uh, to Sitka Center for having me here for the week. Uh, it's so nice after a very long winter in Montana to see some greenery. Uh, it's like just this breath of fresh air. So I've been photographing um, in some old forests and uh, having and looking for birds out on the ocean and having a, a really good time. So I appreciate the uh, um, hospitality. So I'm just gonna uh, jump right into it here. So I'm gonna I'm gonna step back um, a decade. Um, I've been uh, working on projects related to climate change uh, and deep time for about yeah you know, pretty much from since 2012, and I've become really interested in ice um, around the globe and ice as an archive of. Earth's history, its climate history. Uh, one of my favorite writers is uh, Gretel Ehrlich, and I think this is a, a, a great quote to start with, which gives uh, context to sort of how I'm thinking about um, ice and photographing it and collaborating with scientists. So a glacier is an archivist and historian. It saves everything, no matter how small or big, including pollen, dust, heavy metals, bugs, bones, and minerals. It regs every fluctuation of weather. A glacier is time incarnate, a moving image of time. So what I'm interested in is that uh, as landscapes around the globe change and shift, that this archive that's embedded in layers of ice in glaciers uh, is being lost. And so I see my role as an artist as in some ways trying to preserve something related to that archive and to create a conversation around it. So I'm going to start uh, back in 2012, as I said, with a project called The Last Glacier, which is uh, now something that dominates uh, my art practice. Uh, I belong to uh, a collective of artists called The Last, the Last Glacier Collective. It's three artists. The collective was started by a very close friend of mine from graduate school, Todd Anderson. We went to UNM together, and this is him in the photograph. And I live in Montana, as you heard, and uh, this is Glacier National Park. And in 2011, he invited me to join him and another friend of ours, an artist uh, named Bruce Crownover, who was a master printer at Tandem Press until recently, uh, to join him in hiking to as many glaciers in Glacier National Park in northern Montana to document the remaining glaciers in the park. And this is uh, Todd climbing up a very steep, tall moraine uh, to Blackfoot Glacier uh, with Jackson Glacier in the background. If you, I'm sure some of you have been to Glacier National Park. Jackson Glacier is the prominent glacier that you can see from going to the Sun Road. 
um, and it's uh, melting fairly rapidly. Blackfoot Glacier is um, the largest mass of ice that's still left in the park. So at the turn of the 20th century, there were 135 glaciers left in the park. Um, currently, depending on you know, how you define a glacier, you're looking at between 18 and 25 glaciers that are left. So they're, they're rapidly changing. So this photograph is from um, 2013. It's another photograph of, of Todd. This is a very famous spot called um, the Garden Wall. The below you can see closest to Todd Grinnell Glacier, sorry, um, the Salamander Glacier. And then below that, you can see Grinnell Glacier. And it's probably the most popular hike uh, in Glacier National Park, sees many hundreds of people every day. Uh, really, really beautiful spot. Keep this picture in mind. I might come back to it I, uh, because Todd makes a, a print from this exact same spot. Um, so I'm a photographer. Uh, this is my setup. I use a um, high resolution medium format digital camera that I can record the landscape in high detail. So if you come to the show uh, on Saturday, uh, you can see the actual prints and you'll see that they um, are very detailed. And part of my intent is to envelop the viewer in the space. Um, I've gotten to travel to some really remote locations that many people uh, will not have the chance to get to. And so I see my role as, at least in some small way, bringing that landscape to other people um, that might not get to see it in person. So I take notes. Um, generally, when I'm photographing glaciers, I will record the GPS location so that in the future, um, other photographers will be able to um, visit that same place and possibly re-photograph that spot to see how the ice has changed, how the landscape has changed. So um, my, one of my mentors at Arizona State University was Mark Klett, uh, who's a well-known Western photographer who is in part responsible for the second view and the third view re-photographing re William Henry Jackson photographs from the um, 18th century, uh, sorry, 19th century, and um, some other well-known photographers, William Bell, uh, et cetera. So I've been heavily influenced um, by him in my practice. Uh, this is Bruce, Bruce Carnover. Um, so Todd and Bruce are both printmakers. Uh, they both make uh, reductive woodblock prints. So uh, here, Bruce is using a jigsaw to cut out from the plate that he's working on. And it's a destructive process where by the time the print is done, the plate is destroyed and you cannot uh, recreate the print. So this is what one of Bruce's um, plates looks like in progress. and a print in prog process. So it's basically building up layers of different ink colors as the uh, wood block is reduced. So um, as a collective, we see our role as bearing witness to changing landscapes. Um, you know, it's tough as an artist um, to feel like you can have really any effect on anything. Um, so we see our role more as uh, keeping a record of some kind, um, hence the bearing witness. And we do this by making a body of work that relates specifically to a geographic area, um, such as Glacier National Park, uh, from the perspective of three different artists, uh, myself, a photographer, and then two printmakers. And then we br bring that together as a, uh, a book. Um, these are not uh, mass produced books. They're very limited editions and they're large scale. So it's kind of mammoth. If you think of Audubon's mammoth uh, bird book, it's um, some of them are uh, on that scale. Um, 
and it's really sort of the view of that landscape from the perspective of the different artists in, in the group. So we make a, a book called A Drum Leaf, if any of you are book binders, it's not a very common book form. Um, you know, most books are, are bound using case bound. Um, uh, it's something I'm pretty, I'm fairly obsessed with. I, I love to make books. It's become really my practice is making uh, large scale mammoth books. And if you come to the exhibition, I will have uh, one of my large books here from a project I did on Kilimanjaro. Uh, and this was a technique that was used in the 16th century, I believe. Check my dates. Yeah, 16, sorry, 1600s. Um, to, to bind really large maps. And uh, a well-known um, American bookbinder named Timothy Ely, I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing that correctly, um, saw one of these map kind of uh, books in a collection in Utah, and he kind of reinvented the process and created this drum leaf process. And it's characterized by this floating spine, which allows you to lay the book almost perfectly flat, uh, which for me as a photographer, uh, photographing predominantly landscapes, really is uh, the ideal book form. I haven't found anything else. So you're looking at a single image spread across the entire book. So that's one print straight off an inkjet printer. Um, it goes straight across the gutter. So you don't have to deal with any, if you guys know what imposition is, um, you don't have to deal with any issues related to imposition. Um, so you basically have a stack of folded prints, which are called folios, and they are drummed or glued on the fore edge. So you actually have space in between the pages, as you can see in this um, uh, image. Uh, I print on, a, people always ask me what paper I use. And I generally um, use uh, Japanese washi papers. You might have heard them referred to as rice paper. There is no rice in rice paper, it's, uh, it's washi. And uh, I use Asuka or another paper called Niyodo. And so this is a spread um, in the book. And if you remember the, the picture of Todd on the garden wall, this is his interpretation um, from that view, uh, looking down on the salamander and then below that uh, Grinnell Glacier. So you'll see pretty quickly that we, uh, the three of us uh, have very different aesthetics. Um, I would characterize myself as a formalist. Um, I don't generally manipulate my photographs in any way. Uh, if I do anything, I desaturate them. I'm very, um, I'm keenly aware of not falling into the, the trap of what I call the kitsch sublime. Um, it's kind of postcard art that's uh, Glacier National Park might be well known for. So I try to focus on um, the, the subtle detail of the space uh, and a very sort of straightforward approach. Um, this is an important image from the project um, because of the, on the left-hand side, you'll note a automated weather station, which is, was placed there by scientists. I don't know the scientists who placed it there, but it basically collects um, climate uh, and weather data from that particular spot. And I was, um, when I found that, uh, fascinated by it and wanted to know more about what it meant and uh, what it was used for. And I'll get to more of that later. So one image I might um, consider sort of falling on that edge of um, the sublime and then maybe falling into to a little bit of the kitsch, um, but a larger landscape um, or sort of classic view of Glacier National Park. And this is the below view of the salamander. So that little notch on the far right hand side of the image is the garden wall where Todd was sitting looking down on the salamander. So you can hike 
all the way around the back of that and then up onto that notch and then look down onto the glaciers from above. And over the course of um, three summers, I, I think we did like 500 miles of hiking. We did about close to 200 miles uh, every summer and trying to basically get to as many of the glaciers as we could. And we visited, I think, um, 15 of the 20 odd remaining glaciers. Some of them are really hard to get to. They're not, um, not super accessible. Um, so this is one of Bruce, Bruce's prints. And Bruce is about, uh, almost, I think he's a decade older than me. Uh, he's in his 60s. So uh, he's a, a kid of the 70s. And his color aesthetic is, is much more vibrant um, than my own, uh, which tends to be more sedate. Uh, and so I think it's interesting to come to this book to see this kind of the very sort of three different viewpoints of um, the landscape. It's one of my photographs, again, focusing uh, specifically on Grinnell Glacier. So this is um, summer, sorry, winter snowpack that's frozen and the actual glacier is only in the far back. Um, this foreground, you know, by this is in July, by August, this is all melted. And so these are some, some local day trippers who've hiked up to the top, uh, walking over the, um, the lake, which is frozen. Um, you don't see uh, a lot of classic, if you've seen a lot of glacier photographs from, say, Chile or um, Iceland, you get a lot of classic uh, head wall, um, layered stratigraphy of ice. You don't see a lot of that in uh, Glacier National Park. A lot of the glaciers are really kind of remnant at this point. But this is Blackfoot Glacier, which I mentioned before. And this is the head wall on Blackfoot Glacier. And it's still got significant ice present. So uh, in terms of scale, this is the largest book that, I, that I've ever made. Um, this. Uh, when it's open measures 40 by 50 inches, so truly mammoth. Um, it weighs, I don't know, 40 pounds. It's, it's pretty insane. Um, so this is a project I did on my own. Um, what I found is because I'm a photographer, photography is in some ways easy. Um, it's much more immediate. And so I can work much more quickly than Bruce and Todd. When I, collaborate with them, um, a project will usually take uh, two years, three years to complete. Uh, and so, you know, I have to often, I'm done doing what I have to do because I'm just using an inkjet printer and they're hand making all their prints. And so I will work on other projects on the side. And so I've been fortunate enough through funding from my university and from Guggenheim Foundation uh, and through selling these books, been able to fund expeditions all over the world uh, uh, to document, as I said before, very specific geographic areas where the landscape is changing. And in Africa, there are three places uh, where there are still uh, glaciers. Uh, one of them is in Tanzania on Kilimanjaro, uh, which is the, the tallest uh, mountain in Africa. Um, then the other two are Mount Kenya and the others, you, um, the Rowenzori Mountains in Uganda. Um, so because I'm from South Africa originally, um, it became sort of high priority to go back to the continent uh, that I'm from to document the uh, remaining ice there. Uh, I have not been to Mount Kenya yet. Um, the ice there is mostly gone. I'm not sure that I will go there, but I have been to Uganda fairly recently. So on this expedition, um, so I'll, I'll sort of step back a bit. When I was um, photographing Glacier National Park and I saw that weather station that I mentioned before, I started to realize that I really didn't know a lot about glaciers. Um, I didn't understand the science of them. I knew that I loved to look at them and how beautiful they were and they were easy uh, and beguiling to photograph. Um, but I started to think uh, about at what point was it just a photograph of a glacier and then another photograph of a melting glacier uh, and sort of this symbol of climate change. 
And beyond that, you know, what kind of significance did it have? Um, and so I started to think about that I really wanted to learn from scientists about what they knew. And um, I thought about, well, I'm collaborating with other artists. Why can't I collaborate with scientists? And I started doing some web research and really I started just uh, looking at places that I wanted to visit uh, to photograph and Kilimanjaro was number one on my list. And I found this photograph that I found astonishing of the ice on Kilimanjaro and it had a guy's name in the bottom uh, it said Douglas Hardy, copyright. And I just typed in Google, Douglas Hardy or Douglas R. Hardy and his name came right up. He's the scientist who uh, is a glaciologist at the University of Massachusetts. And I found his email and I emailed him and I said, um, I'd love to join you on one of your expeditions to Kilimanjaro, can I come along? And he emailed back within a couple of hours which I was astonishing to me. Uh, and turns out he had done his graduate work at Montana State University where I teach, the very fond memories of Bozeman. And he said, yeah, as long as you can find funding, um, you're welcome to join me. So I joined him uh, on a trip to Peru in 2015. And then in 2016, I, I joined him on an expedition to Kilimanjaro, which he goes to uh, every single year um, to download high definition data from his weather stations that he has both in Peru and on Kilimanjaro that cannot be uploaded to satellite. So uh, this is a year, he's in his 60s and uh, this will be his final year climbing Kilimanjaro. And I think, I think it's gonna be his 25th time. The time I went up with him, it was his 19th or something, I forget. Um, anyway, so he was very, very generous uh, and welcoming. And this is what I found about most scientists that I have um, contacted is that they've been very generous and really interested in collaborating with me. So I made this project on Kilimanjaro, which was really uh, a juxtaposition between portraits of the men who helped get us up the mountain as guides, and as porters, um, and then the landscape that they are dependent on for uh, their living. So uh, growing up in South Africa during apartheid, I'm very uh, conscious of my, my colonial, post-colonial uh, history, growing up as a privileged white male uh, in, um, yeah, in a traumatized country, I guess. And so I, I was, I, <clears throat> Before 2012, I was making a lot of portraits of South African people, uh, really interested in the realities of everyday life in South Africa. And I mean, continue to be interested in that, especially with climate change, how climate change is affecting people. And so the book was this kind of the landscape next to um, these portraits. So I'm gonna get, I'm coming to the collaboration, I promise. <laughs> Um, that I'm just going to show, I think, I think there's one more book. Uh, and I've done a, a, a bunch of these books. Uh, I don't know, at this point, I've done a, a dozen of them. And um, they're generally uh, collected by institutions. Um, preferably, I prefer them to go to teaching institutions where students can get to handle them and see them. Um, and generally, they don't go to private collections at all. Um, maybe one or two. So this is a quite a recent project in uh, 2019. Uh, I got to go to Antarctica on a National Science Foundation grant, uh, an amazing opportunity um, called the uh, Antarctic Artists and Writers Program, uh, which is funded by the National Science Foundation. So it's funded by uh, tax dollars. And um, Todd and I wrote proposals for three years to go. Finally, we got uh, accepted and uh, we'll talk about, I'll talk more about that project coming up. Um, and this is a book that I made of aerial photographs uh, flying over the Ross Sea, um, which is near McMurdo Station, which is the big American uh, research base um, 
on the Antarctic continent. So some of them are from helicopters, from a helicopter. Um, we only got one, two helicopter flights on the same helicopter. And then two of two uh, on a twin otter um, fixed wing plane. Um, as you might have noticed, I, I'm drawn to these uh, full bleed spreads in my books so that the, the landscape becomes this kind of enveloping experience. So this, um, my experience with Doug in um, Peru and then uh, in, on Kilimanjaro led to this project called Naturalists of the Long Now, which is the name of this talk. And it's the project I received the Guggenheim for and that I continue to work on. Um, it's a laborious project. Uh, it takes a lot of planning and time and uh, effort. So it's, I'm not able to complete a lot of um, pieces. Um, but if you're interested, I will have 16 of the artworks from the series at Blue Sky Gallery on exhibition in Portland next month. Uh, the opening is June 2nd. Um, I, I will be there for that. So my, my biggest influence um, is uh, without a doubt, uh, Alexander von Humboldt. So uh, I'm not quite sure why uh, he's not famous in the United States. He is famous with some people, um, but if you travel to Latin America, um, von Humboldt or Humboldt is extremely famous, uh, probably as famous or more famous than Darwin. Um, and some of the concepts that he came up with are things that we really take for granted now. But the thing that has fascinated me about uh, Humboldt is that he was, he was kind of this jack of all trades guy. Right? He was an, an ardent abolitionist, uh, an ardent environmentalist. Um, he knew very early on the damage that monocultures were doing um, being farmed around the world. Um, but he was really the first to articulate the idea of an interconnected ecology. And this is a very famous map that he made of Chimborazo, which is uh, a mountain uh, in Ecuador, and actually the tallest mountain on earth. Um, it's taller than Everest if you measure from the center of the planet. So earth is an ellipse, um, and um, because it's close to the equator, it's furthest from the center. So quite tall. Um, and in, let's see, what was the year? Um, 1802, uh, Humboldt climbed this with his friend, um, Aimé, Aimé Bonplan, and I don't know how to pronounce that very well, to not quite the summit, but um, he claimed 5,875 meters some subsequent research has been done. They don't think he climbed quite that high. Um, and he took very, very careful measurements of barometric pressure. He uh, took very careful notes of all the different uh, plant species that he encountered at different elevations. Uh, and he made this map uh, of where he found which particular plants. So this is a detail at what elevation they were, what the, bar what the barometric pressure was, what the temperature was, all these different very careful annotations. And he made this beautiful map about it. And it's sort of, it's this common, for me, this beautiful combination of art and science uh, that was very uh, dominant during the Victorian era. Um, education at that time, I think for, uh, for many of wealthy people who had access to that kind of education, um, were trained as artists and scientists, uh, which has very much in our time become very separated. Um, so I'm currently working on a project <clears throat> on Chimborazo because of upslope drift and because the glaciers are receding uh, and because Humboldt took very careful notes of where he found different plant species, um, about every decade, those plant species are moving 10 to 12 meters higher up the mountain because there's no ice to prevent it from growing there. 
Um, this is Antisana, which is uh, not very far from Chimborazo, uh, where um, Humboldt spent a lot of his time. And this hut, which is going to ma undergo major renovations in the next few years, was the hut where he stayed to do a lot of his research um, on Antisana. And I got to visit there last year. So this is Doug, um, the first scientist I collaborated with. And this is him with a hand ice drill on Kilimanjaro. And this is the first expedition I did with him uh, in Peru. Um, and you can see from this photograph, so he, he studies this glacier called Calcaya Glacier. Um, and I was there 2015. And the photograph I'm holding is a very famous um, glaciologist, uh, Lonnie Thompson from Ohio State University. And you can see the difference from the photograph that was taken in 2011 to my photograph in 2015. You're seeing about a 30 foot retreat uh, per year or a 1% reduction in ice. So pretty dramatic. As the ice is um, retreating, uh, they are collecting plant samples that have been submerged by ice for over 6,000 years. So that's Lonnie Thompson with the uh, purple gloves on. So this is the first collaboration I did with um, a scientist and the, it was with Doug. And so as I mentioned with, uh, with Humboldt, um, I feel like for scientists, their discipline has become so focused uh, and very narrow uh, and the language is such that it's very difficult for a lay person to understand. Um, I've tried to read quite a few uh, papers, scientific papers on glaciology, uh, on climate change, and they often are impenetrable. And so uh, in this project, I feel like my intent and my role is to help scientists become artists again, and to help bring the research that they are doing uh, in an, under, an understandable way um, to a different audience, uh, a larger audience. Um, and so what I do is I, I go to where they're doing their research, I make a photograph, and then I come home and I make a very large print, like uh, 40 inches, and I send the print to them. Uh, original prints, and I have them write directly onto the print. So this is a weather station. This is one of Doug's weather stations on Kalkaya Glacier in Peru, which I think is this incredible modernist sculpture. It's this really beautiful kind of um, human artifact on top of the ice that he's built over uh, two decades. And then he, what I find super interesting is how different all the scientists are, um, the way they approach their annotations. Um, Doug is very precise. Like everything is very carefully laid out. Um, he marks everything on the weather station and uh, what each thing on the weather station does. <clears throat> so, um, uh, a is Kalkaya Ice Cap is the largest tropical glacier on Earth uh, in the Cordillera Volcanota of Peru at 13.9 degrees south and 70.8 degrees west. The ice cap is currently uh, approximately 40 kilometers squared in area, declining at a rate of uh, approximately 1% per year. And then it goes on. Um, this piece will not be in the show in Portland, unfortunately. I don't have it anymore. Um, on that same trip was um, another scientist from Massachusetts, uh, Karsten Brown. Become quite good friends with Karsten, and we've done uh, some uh, subsequent co collaborations together, which I'll show you. And so you can see um, this is also a photograph I made on Kalkaya, um, the very different kind of uh, approach that he takes. Uh, his approach is a bit more didactic, um, sort of explaining, you know, in a um, very accessible way uh, 
what each part of the glacier is. I think um, what I've realized is that the project is, uh, is well, as I mentioned before, quite difficult um, in terms of logistics and cost, um, getting to very remote places where glaciologists, glaciologists do their work. And so more and more in the last few years, I've collabor been collaborating with um, scientists on my own campus. And so this was the first um, collaboration I did at, at Montana State. Uh, this is Pamela Santimenez Avila, who was at that time a PhD student um, from Chile. And this is in a clean lab uh, on, in, on campus. I'm actually photographing this through um, glass. I was not allowed in the room because it has to be kept um, super clean and you cannot contaminate the ice. And so this is a uh, piece of ice that she's cut from an Antarctic ice core, retrieved from the West Antarctic ice sheet, um, and is about 10,000 years old, is a detail. <clears throat> yeah, 10,833 years old. Um, and what Pamela was doing was um, melting the ice to extract uh, viruses, bacteria, pollen, um, to, well, again, sort of, I'm not a scientist, a little bit above, above my pay grade, but she's looking at indicators of climate at that particular time in Earth's history. I guess I should, um, I'm gonna step back slightly. So a glacier um, is formed by falling snow. And when the snow doesn't melt, uh, and then the following winter, more snow falls on top of it, that snow from the previous year gets compressed into something called fern, F-I-R-N. And eventually that fern becomes ice. And then those layers of snow and fern and ice build up to form a glacier. So when you don't get melt, complete melting over the summer, you get glacier formation. So what's happening now is that all of the snow that falls in certain area is melting and you're not getting any glacial accumulation. Um, and when you look at uh, a cross section of a glacier, you get stratigraphy of ice built up in layers, and each layer indicates a year of falling snow that has been compressed in the, into that ice. So you can look back in time at this exact archive of um, that snow at that particular time when it fell to earth. And you can imagine if you've been in a snowstorm that what snowflakes look like. And when they fall, they trap air. And so that air that they trapped is an exact sample of Earth's atmosphere at that time. And um, we can extract that air from the ice. About 10% of that ice core is made up of air bubbles. And we can look at the different chemical content of the air in the ice core. Uh, obviously, with climate change, scientists are interested in uh, CO2. And if we have a, a linear um, history of ice cores through a certain period of time, we can look at that change in carbon content over um, that distant past. Um, this is a ice patch in uh, Montana in the Beartooth Mountains near where I live. Um, with um, where an ice patch is uh, basically a stationary glacier. Glaciers are moving masses of ice and ice patch is stationary, um, which was formed uh, 6,000 plus years ago, the last uh, glacial period. And as it's melting, um, there's a lot of interesting archeology span that's being done on these ice patches. Um, this is a group of uh, native um, archaeologists as well as archaeologists from uh, Montana State University as well as private archaeologists 
And they're taking, this is what taking an ice core from the ice patch looks like. Uh, and what they're finding is that this particular ice patch was the site of a big horn kill site. So native peoples, uh, most likely descendants of the Shoshone um, were living at 10,000 feet and they were harvesting uh, large numbers of big horn sheep. So living up there all summer. And as this um, ice patch melts, these um, remains of big horn sheep are melting out of the ice patch. And there are, it's, it's crazy. I mean, I, I was just astonished. Uh, hundreds of bones and skulls and horns. Uh, and the really interesting thing is that there's a lot of uh, poop <laughs> um, from the big horn sheep. And as they pull up the ice cores, you can smell big horn sheep poop that's 6,000 years old. It's really quite bizarre. Um, and this is another site um, where archaeologists are working in Glacier National Park. This is Saya Ice Patch. And um, Dr. Rachel Reckon I collaborated with, and she tells in this, in her annotations, um, that experience of pulling up an ice core and smelling um, the bighorn sheep um, poop. I can read a bit of this quickly. We call high elevation patches of ice and snow because they are repositories of ancient paleobiological and paleoclimatological information. They contain ice that is thousands of years old and they offer us glimpses of the flora and fauna through those years, as well as shifts in relative moisture and temperature. They contain what we call lag deposits of organic material, sometimes as many as eight inches thick, interspersed with layers of ice and snow. We can radiocarbon date the organic layers as shown above and can also identify pollen and plant material within them. To be honest, the lag deposits are mostly sheep dung and when they thaw, they smell, they smell like it. Uh, but the data they contain about ancient environments is irreplaceable and um, you know, as you can see from the images, they're melting super rapidly. Um, living in uh, the West, um, uh, especially in Montana, I'm very uh, aware of fire. Um, and so I've been working with scientists to explore the history of fire. So I'm moving beyond just ice. I'm really interested in uh, scientists who are paleoclimatologists, who uh, look at the climate back in time. Uh, this is a fire that was, I took this photograph from, uh, from my house uh, and just two years ago, the, the closest I've ever been to a large fire and it was uh, kind of a reality check. Um, and so I've been collaborating with scientists who <coughs> take mud cores samples uh, to, to research uh, the history of fire in different regions around the world. So this was a graduate student, James Bennis, um, and this is a, a small lake uh, close to Bozeman. And this is a mud core that I photographed in uh, his lab um, from the lake in front. You can see uh, very clear stratigraphy uh, in the mud core. And towards the bottom, you can see a very prominent white stripe, which is uh, used by geologists to date mud cores in many areas in the West because this is from the Glacier Peak um, eruption uh, from the Cascade Mountains uh, in Washington State, uh, I believe. And they know exactly when that occurred. And so they can look at the stratigraphy and very carefully date things. And they can look at, um, and you can see visually, uh, very clear periods of where there's a lot of fire happening uh, above the white stripe, you can see layers of gray, and that's generally um, ash that's being deposited in the lake. And then you get periods where um, there's different reds and um, it's less carbon content uh, and less fire. And so um, you can see this kind of very uh, linear history of fire in that particular area. Um, this is again in the Beartooth Mountains working with a bunch of uh, different scientists. Some of them are archeologists. Um, some of them are fire scientists. And it's taken an ice core. 
And this is a very interesting um, ice patch because again, it's about uh, six to 10,000 year old ice. And as the ice melts, they're finding these very large trunks from white bark pines. And if you look at the landscape around, there's no other trees there, right? This is way above uh, tree line, about five, four to 500 feet above current tree line. But six to 10,000 years ago, there were these very large white bark pines growing at this location. And so it indicates a period of warming when um, the conditions were um, amenable to these large trees um, growing at this location. And there was a, um, this collaboration with, was with um, a friend of mine, uh, Dave McQuethy from Montana State. And he told me just, uh, I think two months ago or last month, there was a paper published that indicates that the conditions are now ripe again for um, the trees to, to be growing at this elevation again. So it's likely that we'll start seeing the white bark pines colonizing higher up into the Beartooth. Uh, another collaboration I did with Dave, this is the, again, um, remains of the white bark pines, which are, you know, as they're exposed to the sun and the weather, they're disintegrating. They're sort of collapsing after they've been preserved in ice for 6,000 years. Uh, another collaboration I did with a uh, ecologist, Jenny McCarty. She was a, a graduate student at MSU, and she's looking at how insect species are moving upstream. Uh, this is a very famous river for fly fishermen or anglers, should I say, the Gallatin River, if any of you are anglers. You might have heard of the Gallatin. Part of the river runs through it, through it was filmed on this river. As the temperatures of the river warm, the insect species are colonizing further up the river. And you can see some of her annotations. And she drew caddisfly and mayfly into the rock. So Jenny definitely had some artistic training. And this is uh, Karsten again in the Ruanzoris. Uh, back into Africa, closest I have ever come to dying. I um, had asthma-induced pneumonia at high, uh, high elevation. Uh, when I took these photographs, I was so incredibly sick. I, didn't, I wasn't sure whether I was going to get off the mountain. So as I get older, there's definitely some risk involved in some of these expeditions. And so some collaborations I did with Karsten, and he, we used a lot of historic photographs in these collaborations where the insert image is from Tony of the earlier in the 20th century. So what was ice is no longer ice. And this is at about 16,000 feet. And some of the, the last glaciers left in the Ruanzoris are also called the mountains of the moon. Uh, this one I annotated myself and I kind of talked about my experience of thinking I was gonna die. This is what the glaciers look like. It's, uh, it's really rotten ice. If any of you have been on uh, close to glaciers, spend time on glaciers, you can look at that and see that that's, the ice is crumbling and just completely rotten, meaning it's melting really fast. And then my last project, I'm just mentioned briefly what I'm working on now. I'm finish, finishing up a, a, a book with Todd on our expedition to Antarctica, thanks to the National Science Foundation. That's uh, arriving at McMurdo on a C-17. And we got to spend a week in the deep field uh, with a team from Princeton, coring for the oldest ice ever retrieved by humans. Uh, this is in a very special place called the Allen Hills, where there's no accumulation. The, the ice is scoured by catabatic winds, and the accumulation is many hundreds of miles away. The ice is pushed here um, from a, that distant accumulation zone, and the geography of it is such that there is this upwelling of ice against um, mountain formations, and it's led to this unique geography where at very shallow depths, you can find exceptionally old ice. And it's the oldest ever found by humans, uh, 2.7 million years old. 
Uh, play a quick video. John this is what it's like there. This is inside the mess tent. It's famous for very bad <laughs> weather. In Antarctica, you're not allowed to uh, pee on the ground. So those big barrels there are all our pee that gets stored. And that gets flown uh, to McMurdo and then put on a ship and shipped back to the United States. So the very um, strong regulations recently about what you can and cannot do there. So these guys um, spend uh, seven weeks uh, working in those conditions. Uh, it's not always like that, but it's always very, very cold. On the left image, and this is basically a layout for the book that Todd and I are working on. Um, these are two expert ice core drillers, Elizabeth Morton and Tanner Kuhl, and then uh, two PhD students on the right, um, Austin Carter and Jenna Epifanio uh, from uh, Scripps and from OSU. I'm going to be visiting OSU on um, Thursday to photograph some of the ice from those uh, ice cores. And then a collaboration I did with um, the, the lead scientist, John Higgins from Princeton. Um, this, this piece is in the uh, exhibition in Portland. And then some more spreads from the book. These are technical drawings um, by Tanner and other people on the um, US drilling team of the uh, construction of the ice drill and their ice cores. Out of interest, um, that's the last slide. The dating method, which again is above my pay grade, I'm not a scientist, but uh, it's not super accurate. It's basically, they're looking at two different isotopes of argon and at the rate at which they degas, they can get within about 100,000 years of accuracy, if I'm, if I'm correct. I might be misspeaking, but in that range. But, you know, if you're talking about 2.7 million years, um, 100,000 years, give or take, at least you're in the range. And that's it. Ian, thank you so much. I've got a, a few questions. One of my favorite things about these talks now that we do them online is that it uh, enables connection between uh, past Sika residents and present Sika residents and possibly some future ones. So there's a question from um, Anne Ginsburg Hoffman, who's a, a recent photographer in residence at Sika, and she asked, uh, I imagine you are familiar with the work of Edward Bertinsky. Your work is wonderful. Did you want to uh, talk about possibly Bertinsky or other influences? Um, yeah, sure. I'm very familiar with Bertinsky. I show a video about him in my in a class I teach every spring, although we didn't get to it this spring. Um, yeah, I think it's it, his his work brings up an interesting question, which I've thought about a great deal: the idea of beauty in relationship to catastrophe. And you know, he photographs. He uses a large format camera. And he photographs pollution, climate change, uh, issues around water, all, I mean, all sorts of stuff. Um, but his photographs are always very aesthetic. And I, I think that I probably take a similar approach in that um, beauty and aesthetics, kind of idea of the sublime, are really important uh, to me as a way to, to bring in an audience. And I know that there are other photographers who have come to different conclusions and think differently. Um, Robert Adams, not, not Ansel Adams, Robert Adams, the, the uh, other Adams, he would, he would disagree, I think. Um, and um, yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of uh, value in beauty, especially uh, when we are losing so much. I think, uh, and the word I, usually have used by this point is empathy. Um, and I've totally forgotten to use it today. 
where I feel like part of my purpose as an artist during climate change is to bring empathy to the natural uh, world, the non-human world. And I think aesthetics and beauty is one way to do that. And I think, you know, um, I, I definitely, my aesthetic is different from Bertinsky, um, but yeah, that's one way Bertinsky does it. There's a, a question also, a recent ecologist and artist in residence, uh, Chin Chin asks, great work to connect art with science. What is the most challenge to work with scientists? Um, they're very insecure about their ability to make art and they're very busy. <laughs> so it takes sometimes with scientists on my own campus, it, it tends to be easier because I make friends with them, but it often takes many years of coaxing to bring out a willingness. Um, and sometimes the projects just don't ever happen. So uh, there is a scientist I work with in Antarctica and I sent her prints and nothing. But then like Pam Pamela, you know, I shipped her prints to Chile and she got, she sent them all, way, all the way back. And she, she met with me for coffee to explain, you know, her research and what she was doing. And just, so there's very different personalities and some people are, some are so, super psyched um, and some are, you know, quite reticent. And my friend Dave, who I'm pretty good friends with, and we, we share beers, he was very insecure about his ability to make writing or drawings that were aesthetically pleasing and that would make good art. And he, um, so I had to encourage him that I'm really interested in all of that. That, you know, the, Id the idiosyncrasies of each person, what each person brings to it is interesting in itself. So, and then just logistically, just the, the expense and distance that I have to travel, you know, these folks, they have large grants, often lots of money um, for what they're doing. And I'm an artist and there's no money. And so I have to scrape together um, money to try to uh, tag along. So that's, the, that's a big challenge. Let's uh, close with a technical question. Uh, Joshua writes in asking what types of cameras that you use, Ian. I use two different cameras. I use a Sony a7R4. Um, more and more I use that because it's um, just ease of use. And then I use a, a super high resolution uh, phase one, uh, which is a hundred megapixel camera. There are lots of wonderful uh, compliments and acknowledgements coming in in the chat. Uh, so uh, be sure to check those out. There's a, a question about if this was recorded. It was recorded. So we will be sharing this on Sitka's YouTube channel. Thank you everyone who participated, Ian. I don't know if you uh, heard as you were uh, uh, out and in, but uh, there's just a wonderful turnout for this talk. Uh, just a really wonderful, large Sitka community audience. So thanks everyone for tuning in. Ian, thank you for sharing your work. Jennifer, thank you for hosting. Ian, we can't wait to see the show, uh, including at the opening this Saturday from five to seven at JDC Fine Art and the show runs through uh, late June. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks Good night. everyone, thanks for having me. Thank you.